to open up your Bibles to 1 Peter. We're going to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin at verse 22, and we are going to finish chapter 1 today. Um, Don't worry, it only took us eight weeks to get through chapter 1. We got four more to go, all right? So... Uh, hopefully we'll speed it up, but I, I just, you know, for those of you that are just gathering for the very first time, we are working our way verse by verse through First Peter and just taking our time going through it. I'm not going to review anything today. I need to get right into this. All I can do is encourage you to go on our website, on uh, our, our uh, app, t- YouTube, Facebook, all of the messages are there and you can get caught up. But we're going to get right into this. Verse 22. Peter says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news. Everybody say good news. The good news that was preached to you. Father, be glorified in your word today. And may it draw our hearts to you, I ask, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. One more time, give the Lord all the praise in this house for His goodness and mercy. And then before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him in Jesus' name. The story is told of a construction engineer who was inspecting a building site many, many years ago. And while he was out on a scaffold about three stories high, he suddenly tripped and his body plummeted to the ground to what appeared to be certain death. But at that very moment, a workman below happened to be looking up as the engineer fell, and since he was standing where the man's body would strike the ground without thinking, he instantly braced himself taking the full impact of that falling man. The builder, remarkably, was only slightly injured, but the workman was driven right into the concrete. With almost every bone in his body broken, he walked the streets from that time on as the object of everyone's pity, as you can imagine. Many years later, in an interview with a reporter... He was asked how the man whose life he had saved was treating him. And the crippled man's reply is remarkable. He said, well, he gave me half of everything he owns. I also have a share in his business. He never lets me want for a thing. He is constantly concerned about me and hardly a day passes that I don't receive from him some small token of remembrance for the sacrifice that I made. What a story of gratitude. As I read that in my office this past week, I just thought to myself, you know, as Christians, many times we forget that out on a hill called Golgotha, which is the place of the skull, There was one who caught the full impact of falling man. One who caught us when we would have most certainly been crushed in death under the weight of our own sin and our own transgression. But one Friday, 2,000 years ago, this man braced himself for six hours on an old rugged cross and took the full impact of our fall. Isaiah saw it. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace with God was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. That we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And yet the Lord laid our iniquity upon him. 
Jesus Christ made himself expendable for you and for me. And certainly we ought to be able to express gratitude for all that he has done. Can I hear a good amen? Because if an engineer felt compelled to give half of his belongings, the share of his business, to make sure that this Savior never wanted for anything again, out of nothing but gratitude for saving his temporal life, what ought we as believers be willing to offer to the Lord Jesus Christ for catching our fallen souls and giving us everlasting life in Jesus' name? I'm going to tell you, the least of what we can do is lift our hands on a Sunday morning and magnify His name in Jesus' name. One more time, would you just give Him praise that He saved you one day on that hill in Jesus' name. Now I raise that to you this morning because that, believe it or not, is really what Peter has been trying to get across to us since verse number 13. In verses 1 through 12, Peter discussed the wonders and the majesty of the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. And then in verses 13 through 25, which is the balance of the chapter, he shows us our proper response to that salvation. How are we to respond to this salvation? In verses 13 through 21, he discusses our response to God. How we are to respond to God in light of that salvation. We are to set our hope fully on the grace of God that will be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are to prepare our minds for action. We are to be disciplined thinkers who are no longer conformed to our passions, but we are now holy as He is holy. And throughout our stay here on this earth, we are to conduct ourselves in godly fear. And we're to do this, Peter says, knowing that we have been ransomed from sin, death, hell, and the grave by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So in light of that precious blood shed for us, this is our reasonable act of worship. I love that scripture, and many of you know it, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. He says to us, I beseech you therefore, and we're just going to make it personal, Bethel, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and pleasing unto Him, which is your reasonable act of worship. In light of Christ giving His all on the cross, it is only reasonable that I would give Him everything. In return. And that's what Peter is dealing with now in verses 22 through 25. But he is talking now about how this salvation is going to be responded to as far as my relationship to others. Verses 22 through 25, Peter is speaking about how, in light of salvation, we are to respond to one another. Did you know that your salvation not only impacts your relationship with God, it impacts your relationship with one another? Oh, I love that good amen I'm hearing. You didn't like that. We want to think it's all about God, but the Bible makes it very clear that not only does your salvation impact your relationship with God, but it impacts your relationship with one another. John said it in 1 John chapter 4 this way. He said, how is it possible that you can say you love God whom you have not seen, but you do not love one another who bear the image of God who you see every day? And he's saying that that it's impossible. You cannot, as a believer, say that you love God whom you have never seen, but you do not love others who you see every day and they bear the image of Almighty God. Even unbelievers are still created in the image of God. So even they bear the image of God. If I can't love them who I see every day, then I cannot truly love God who I have never seen. And that's what Peter is dealing with here. Beginning at verse number 22, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. In Peter's mind, 
who is inspired by the Holy Spirit, the proper response of believers to this marvelous, majestic salvation that has been offered to mankind through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, laid down as a ransom so that we might be redeemed, delivered, and free, is to love one another, and not just love one another, but to love one another earnestly. The word earnestly there means intently or deliberately, and it means unceasingly. So for a believer, their deliberate intention every morning is to love men and women without ceasing. Jesus made it clear that I'm even to love my enemies the same way. And everybody said... That even those that rise up against me, I am to love them intently, without ceasing, and deliberately make the choice to overlook what I think I am owed and to focus more on what their need is. This is where Peter starts with all of us. Notice that Peter says that we were saved for a sincere Brotherly love for one another. Sincere, um, there, it just means unhypocritical. It means a genuine, authentic love. And I'm going to tell you, be very transparent with you this morning, that when I was studying this just yesterday, I was so deeply convicted because it's so easy. Listen, I've been in church all of my life. Haven't been saved all of my life, but I've been church all of my life. And it's so easy to come in these settings and to say to everyone, I love you, but say it thoughtlessly. We'll say that we love the body of Christ, but put no thought to it. And that's hypocritical love. And that's why John encouraged us no longer to love in word, but to love in deed or in action. We are to love one another. And this is the idea that Peter has. Having in the past been purified in our heart by our obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another. Now, when we read it today, it almost sounds redundant. It sounds like just a run-on sentence. You know, to a, a sincere brotherly love, love one another. It just sounds, again, redundant, but it's not redundant. It actually speaks to the maturity of a believer, to the progress of the believer, to the growth of the believer. And it's reflected in the fact, and we can't see it in the English, but it is reflected in the fact that Peter used two different words there to describe love. One in sincere brotherly love and then another in love one another. The Greeks were very intelligent. And so they didn't just have one word, love. They understood that there were different loves. They understood that there was a sexual love. They understood that there was a family love. They understood that there was a friendship love. And so they came up with words to describe each one of them, and they would assign them properly. And so in Peter's day, he used two different words here. The first one we're very familiar with because of where we live. Sincere brotherly love. What comes to your mind when you think of brotherly love? Philadelphia, because that is the Greek word, phileo, phileo, um, it is Philadelphia love, it is brotherly love. Now, I don't know about the city, but we are to be men and women of brotherly love. Peter uses this because he says, now, in being born again, you are in the family of God, and the very evidence that you are born again is that you have a sincere, genuine, brotherly love and affection for your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. But for the disciple, Peter says, it doesn't stop there. It begins there, but it doesn't end there. Because he uses a second word. He says, love one another, and that word love's different. It is the word agape. And I only say that because we've heard that word before. It is agape love. And that word, agape, was used by Greeks 2,000 years ago almost exclusively to describe the unique love that you would find among disciples of Jesus Christ. The Greeks actually came up with that word 
Because they said the love among followers of Jesus Christ is so unique, you can't find it anywhere else in the known world. And so they invented that word to describe the unique love they found among the followers of Jesus Christ. And that is a love we are to have for one another. Now listen, many of you know that this subject of love is very dear to my heart and has been for probably the last 22 years or so when I really began to dig it out and to understand what it meant. And it's been a long time since we've had a good heart-to-heart talk about love. So I'm going to take a few minutes even here this morning, and we're going to talk about it because we are living in an age where love is being held hostage by people who know nothing about what love really is. And it's very important that we as believers understand that when we speak of Christian love, we're not talking about love as the rest of the world understands it to be. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, when he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he made this very provocative statement. In John 13 and verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you. Now, why is that provocative? Well, the only one that can give commandments would be God. It was, again, an indirect way of claiming his divinity. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, we would be cool if he had ended right there. If he had just said, love one another, then we would have been all right with it. But anticipating that we would project on that word love, our own definition, he goes further and says, just as I have loved you, you also, say those two words with me, you also, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He said, I came to put on display the love of God, and now you also must love one another in the same way that I have loved you. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That is the agape love. Jesus introduces us to it right there. He says, I came to show a supernatural love and you are also to love one another as I have loved you and it is by this love that the whole world will know you are my disciples. Now, understand that our English language, as much as we love it, is not able to adequately translate that word agape. We just do not have... A a good language to be able to quantify exactly what that word means and what it is trying to transfer. And many of you know my story, and that is why I like to tell it. And that is about 20, 22 years ago, I was reading a sermon that came from the 1700s by a man named Charles Finney, one of the leading voices of the Second Great Awakening in the United States of America. And I found his definition in that sermon. And it has stuck with me all these years. And you know how we have defined love for 20 plus years here at Bethel now. And that is disinterested benevolence. And if you are new to Bethel, I would encourage you to write that somewhere in your Bible. And every time you read the word love, that you would remind yourself that the Christian love is just that. It is disinterested benevolence. Now listen, if this is your first time hearing that, it sounds a little odd. It even sounds maybe a little cold because of how you think that word disinterested is used. When we hear disinterested, we think that we're not interested uninterested and that it's benevolence that I give but I'm not really that interested in you at all but understand that is not what disinterested means disinterested doesn't mean uninterested it means emptied of all interest and in this context it is to be emptied of all selfish interest It is to be emptied of all selfish motives, of all selfish intents. And so when you put disinterested 
to, de- to define the love that we're talking about, what you're saying is that it is benevolence. And all that benevolence includes, which would be mercy and grace and forgiveness and kindness. I mean, you just put it in there. Whatever flows out of love, it is to be done in the body of Christ disinterestedly. That I demonstrate this love completely emptied of any selfish interest, of any selfish motive, of any selfish intent and therefore this love is the purest form of love because it takes absolutely no interest in any personal benefit or gain but it is focused exclusively upon the object of my affection for the believer my first love is the Lord God Almighty and so all that I do in demonstrating my love for God is not done with any selfish intent or interest. So when I give my offerings and I give my tithes, it's not so that I can get back something. If I never get anything back, I don't care. I still give. Because I love Him disinterestedly. And that when I love my wife, And that when I love my children and I love this church and I do any benevolent act to them, it is emptied of any selfish interest, of any selfish intent. It has no strings attached. I'm not looking for anything in return. And the moment that I am is the moment that I have proven I have done it with my interests in heart and mind. This is the love we're to walk in. It is the love that God demonstrated for us. Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God wanting to manifest His disinterested benevolence did not wait for us to come to Him. He came to us while we were still in sin and wanted nothing to do with us. It's disinterested benevolence. And this is the love that we have been called to have for one another. Paul, you'll remember this very well, he defined love in one chapter, devoted one chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to the understanding of what love is. And let me just summarize it as he did. Love is patient and kind. And why wouldn't it be? Because I've emptied myself of all of my interests, so sure I'm going to be patient. Because what fuels impatience? Self-interest. I yell at the person in front of me because they're not going fast enough because it's all about me. But when you've emptied yourself of your interests, you're free to be patient. Come on, say amen. And you're certainly able to be kind. Love is not jealous. Why would it be jealous? If I've emptied myself of all of my interests, of all of my intents and all of my motives, then how could I covet anything that you have? How could I be jealous of anything that you possess? In fact, I would go out of my way to make sure you got more. I love the way I'm preaching now. (laughs) Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. It's not rude. Do you know what, what agonizes my heart? Is that I have been with professing Christians who brag about how rude they are. That will actually wear it like a badge of how they spoke to someone. And I'm like, wait a minute. By your own words, you condemn yourself. Because love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Some of you husbands and wives love you. But all you fight about is getting your way. When true love defers to the other. Because I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve. Love is not irritable. It's not easily irritated. And it keeps no record of being wrong. Some of you carry diaries of every wrong that people have committed against you. 
and bring it out every time there is an argument. Love covers a multitude of sins. In Jesus' name. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It always is hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Why? Because I've emptied myself of all my selfish interests. So I'm I'm able to endure because it's not about me. See, this is the antithesis of the love that is often touted today in the United States of America, and I would assume through the better part of the world, where you hear silly statements like this, love is love. Are you smoking marijuana? Probably today. It's all legal. I mean, everywhere you go, you smell it. But, but like, love is love. What does that mean? Love is love. I know what you think it means. Love is not love. Love doesn't define itself. Love is selfless. Love is disinterested. And it doesn't matter if the other person that you feel attracted to is complicit in it. Love restrains me. And says, I know what is right because I read the word of the Lord. And for the sake of God's kingdom and the sake of you, even if you don't recognize it, I am going to refrain from my, retra- from my attractions because it is better to put my trust in the living God Almighty. The, but the world doesn't see that. To the world, love is emotional. It is self-serving. It is a feeling that you can have. Therefore, it's something you can fall into and it can be fallen out of. It doesn't endure because it's just a fleeting feeling and emotion. And let's be honest, if that was the way it was, we would have all abandoned our marriages a long time ago because we don't always feel that emotion of love. But when you're emptied of yourself, you endure. Because it was never about me in the first place. It was always for the glory of Almighty God. And it was for the benefit of my fellow man. Love is emptied of self. It does not demand its own way. Now, listen. Am I saying that people that do not know the Lord have no capacity to demonstrate loving and kind acts no not at all because we're still created in the image of god but what i am saying is that they can't do it disinterestedly that only happens within the born again believer and we'll see that in a moment at the very least they are doing what they're even when they're doing kind acts they're doing it because they like the feeling that they have when they give to others jesus said that it is more blessed to give than to receive And so even an unbeliever can stumble upon that truth and see the joy that is in somebody else's life. And so they start becoming a giving person, but because it makes them feel good, or they like the applause that they get, they like the excitement that that person has, or they want to get something from them in return. But it is not done disinterestedly. And you know that because when it's not reciprocated, when they're not thanked, they get upset. In fact, that is a great way to test because some of you say, how do I know if I'm doing it disinterestedly? If you get angry when you don't get a pat on the back or no one acknowledges what you've done, you've done it for yourself and not for the glory of God or for the benefit. At some point, you've got to be able to walk away and say, I never did it for them to begin with. I did it for the glory of Christ. I did it because that's who I am in the Lord. Can I tell you, this kind of love will revolutionize your life. Like I'm telling you, I don't care how bad your marriage is right now. If you can start loving your husband and your wife this way, you'll never argue again. The only argument you would ever have is, no, I insist, let's do it your way. No, I insist, let's do it your way. No, 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 I insist, let's do it your way. Because you're deferring to one another because you see each other not as those who want to serve you but those who you can serve and that's why Jesus said if you have this kind of love 
the world will know you're my disciples. Many years later, John would pick up on that and he would write in 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love disinterestedly does not know God because God is love. Pretty direct, huh? I, I mean, you think I'm a tough pastor. Imagine Pastor John sitting down with you and you telling him how you can't get along and he says, well, you don't know God. Because if you knew God, you'd love disinterestedly. Because God loves disinterestedly. He went on in verse 9 to say, in this, the love of God was made manifest. So he's sharing with us, this is how perfect love operates in this love of in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him and in this is love not that we have loved God but the love but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the covering the atonement that's what it means for our sin beloved if God so loved us we also ought to love one another and in this John said love always makes the first move because God didn't wait for you to come to him he came to your rescue and he was willing to make the sacrifice to bring you back into fellowship with him so here's what I know about love love always makes the first move and love is always willing to sacrifice for reconciliation and if God loved us this way we should love one another the same way Now, I can hear some of you right now, as my friend did many, many years ago, saying, that's impossible. I remember I was in Washington, D.C. with a group of pastors, and we were talking about love, and it came to me, and I shared him my definition, and the one pastor, I've known him for many years, he loved me, I love him, and he just said, Kurt, good luck with that. He said, that's impossible, and I said, that's exactly right. It is impossible. And that's why Jesus said, it's by this kind of love that they'll know you're my disciples because you can't find it anywhere else. When we reduce it down to the world's understanding of love, then we've taken the supernatural element out of it. It can only be given by the grace of Almighty God. And that's why Jesus said, it's by that kind of love that everyone's going to know, whew, they've been with Jesus. And Peter said that. Listen to it again in verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. When he said, having purified your souls, he's talking about a past action that has present and ongoing results or consequences. Because of what I previously did, I can do this now. And Peter is saying, because you have purified your soul in your obedience to the truth. What is the truth there? The truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ that he just summarized in verses 18 through 21, where he said, knowing that you were ransomed, say ransom, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in these last times so that uh, for our sake that through him we might be believers of God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God we sang about it this morning we were dead in our trespasses and sins but Jesus came and laid down his life as a covering for our sin on the third day God raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and our hope would be in the living God almighty that is the gospel of Jesus Christ It's the truth. And because we were obedient to that truth, putting our faith and our hope in Him, and we repented of our sin and surrendered our lives to God, we now have a sincere brotherly love. And out of that comes selfless love for one another. Not just a brotherly affection, but a self-sacrificing love, which Jesus said is the evidence, the evidence that you've been born again. 
And this is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit that is released at the time of salvation. Yes, we're going to bring this back to the Holy Spirit. Because he may not be spoken of here, but he clearly is being involved. Because in verse 23, Peter said, since you have been, say this loud, born again. Say it again. Born again. Since you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of the living God Almighty. Whether you realize it or not, when he said you were born again, he was given a nod to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said in John chapter 3, unless a man be born of the water, natural birth, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Almighty God. We are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about this way back in verse number 3. We haven't just been saved. We haven't just come to an altar. We haven't just recited a sinner's prayer. We were born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Such a radical transformation was to occur when we met Christ that from that moment on we were We're never the same again. We are a new creation in Christ. The old passed away. Everything brand new. In Jesus' mighty name. We died with Christ in our repentance of sin. And then we were raised to new life by the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. And some of you say, well, what is the significance of the Holy Spirit in our salvation? I'm glad you asked, because in Romans 5 and verse 5, Paul said, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He said, you can't go to a class and learn how to love disinterestedly. You can't go to a conference and learn how to live and love disinterestedly. You can't buy a book that will be able to inform you how to love disinterestedly. It is a supernatural love that has to be poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit of God. So if you're struggling with love today, get on your face before God and say, I'm not going to eat another meal until the Holy Spirit pours into my heart a love that will release men and women who have offended me because I'm emptied of myself in Jesus' mighty name. That was to happen at salvation. We are a new creation. Can I, can I hear a good amen? There's a transformation. And this is why Peter says that we were born again, not with perishable seed. Now, just bear with me, because this is a great illustration for it. My first birth on February 11th, 1967, was the result of perishable seed. I'm not trying to be ignorant. That's just the reality. My first birth was the result of perishable seed. I got 23 chromosomes from my mother. I got 23 chromosomes from my father. And I may be biologically and biblically speaking fearfully and wonderfully made, but I assure you I am corruptible, and with every passing year that corruption is getting more visible and harder to contain. Do you know what I'm talking about here today? I feel young, I feel think I still look young, but every morning I am getting further away from recognizing the man I see in the mirror. I I just am amazed and I'm thankful that I have blonde hair because it covers up the gray that is in there. I assure you that it's there. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can put creams and elixirs and you can eat healthy, but you are corrupting day by day. I would get really worried about that, but I'm happy to tell you that many years ago, on the front row, right side, middle aisle seat of my home church, surrounded by the men of God in that fellowship, I was born a second time. But this time with incorruptible seed, which is the living world word of Almighty God. My pastor, like a great farmer, stood up and sowed the seed of God's word. I responded to it, and the Holy Spirit quickened that word in my little heart, and I was born again in Jesus' mighty name. If you know what I'm talking about, would you give God the praise this morning? Hallelujah. 
This is what this is what John was talking about in first in, excuse me in John 1 he said he came speaking of Jesus to his own his own people did not receive him but to all who did receive him if there anybody that's received Christ to all who received him who believed in his name he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God in Jesus mighty name And even though, as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, this outer self is wasting away, I don't lose heart because my inner self is being renewed day by day. This body, it may be breaking down, but this inner man is growing stronger. I know my God better. I know Him more intimately day by day. And there's going to come a moment when this body can't contain what is happening inside of me, and it's going to give way, and I'm going to be in the presence of the living God Almighty because I've been born again. Can somebody give Him the praise if you believe that? Settle down, Kurt. I love what he says in 1 John. This is, I, I could talk about these things forever. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The very reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So no one that's born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Hallelujah. Now, is he saying that we're not going to stumble and fall? Of course not. We know that every day we stumble in one way or another. But what he's saying is no one, no one could deliberately continue to live in sin because they've been born of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God will immediately convict you when you've done something and you deal with it quickly and you move on for the glory of God. Of God. That's what he's saying. Now, at the moment you're born again, are you going to love disinterestedly, like we talked about him? Are you going to do that right at the beginning? Well, let me ask you this question. How many of you walked the moment that you were born? Okay. I was thinking we might have a Superman among us. No one. Well, you're not going to love disinterestedly the moment you're born again. It's a progress. It's a, it's a progression. It's growth. It's maturity. And that was reflected back when he said, he says, you were saved for sincere brotherly love to this loving one another. You grow in it. And may we never forget that. Remember, the Word of God is called a seed. Is there anybody here that has ever planted a seed and got an instant harvest? It takes time. And that's, you have to keep planting that word in your heart. This is why the Bible says don't grow weary in doing well. You will reap if you faint not. Don't give up. It's working in your heart and in your life. Here is what I will say. Even though you will not love disinterestedly at the very moment that you're saved, what I will tell you is that the desire will be there. The want will be there. And you'll feel convicted when you fall short of it. That's just, it, it's, it's there. It's the DNA. You've got the DNA of God inside of you now. So the want, the desire. When Josh and Amanda were born, I never had to coach them or coax them to start trying to creep and then to crawl and then to try to pull themselves up and to try to walk. They just did it naturally because it's instinctive in the heart of man to want to walk and run. And it's instinctive within a born-again believer to want to love one another. It is instinctive within the believer to want to pray, to want to read the Word of the Lord. They don't have to be coached to go to church every Sunday. They want to be in church because the God that created them lives in them and leads them now to what is proper in Jesus' name. Can I hear a good amen? I love this, and we're we're almost done. I know I'm a little over here, but Peter offers this great illustration. It comes from Isaiah 40. He's quoting Isaiah 40. He says, all flesh is like grass, 
And all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. Which is just a simple way of saying that everything that is born of natural seed is just like grass. It's just like the flowers. It's all going to wither and it's all going to fall one day. But I got good news for you. Verse 25 says, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. How many of you are thankful that the word of the Lord remains forever? The, the psalmist said, forever, your word is settled in heaven. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word of God will stand. The word of God will stand. The word of God will stand. It will remain forever. Men and women have tried to take it down, but it just keeps coming back. In 301 AD, the Roman emperor, Diocletian burned thousands of copies of the Bible commanded that all Bibles be destroyed and decreed that any home with a Bible in it should be burned in fact he even built a monument over what he thought was the last surviving Bible he then proudly proclaimed the Christian name has been extinguished the very next emperor, Constantine, made Christianity the state religion of Rome. And 500 years after Diocletian's death, his grave, which was a huge mausoleum, became a Christian church where the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached in Jesus' name. In 1778, Voltaire, the great French philosopher and noted atheist, boasted it took 12 men to start Christianity. One, referring to himself, will destroy it. He died later that year. Before his death, he declared, in 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten and will be an unknown book. But 100 years later, the Geneva Bible Society bought his home, stored Bibles in it, and the very printing presses that Voltaire used to undermine the Christian faith were used to print Bibles, distributed all throughout that land, and Geneva Bible Society is still going on today because the Word of the Lord remains forever and forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of God will stand. Governments will rise. Governments will fall. Presidents will come. Presidents will go. There'll be elections, and then men, men, men and women will be raised up, but then they'll be taken out. But I'm going to tell you, the one constant in this universe is the Word of the living God Almighty. It'll never return unto Him void in Jesus' mighty name. And this is the good news that we preach to you today. Everyone receiving the seed of the Word of God by faith is quickened by the Holy Spirit. And like the Word of God, they will never die, but they will live forever in Jesus' name. Can you give Him all the praise in this house?